Okay, so uh, what you're seeing on the screen is just a bunch of radio images. There's 48 of them starting from lower frequency at this end going to higher frequencies. Each frame is half a second. Uh, this is in just a little bit higher than the FM radio band, 140 to 170 megahertz. And what I just want you to notice is all that is happening here. This is just four minutes of data. Took something like 25,000 images to make this. So there's a whole lot of stuff happening at the radio waves. Uh, even when actually this is a fairly quiet time on the sun, there's one active region which Shraman showed earlier in his talk. But uh, so basically the point to take away from here is that when you look at the sun in radio waves, it's really very dynamic. Okay, and that's what I want to talk about how to extract information from these millions of images, which we can now make uh, of the sun at radio waves. Okay, uh, this is integrated flux density from the sun, frequency on this axis, time on this axis, half a second time resolution. All these sort of horizontal stria which you see are changes in the emission from the sun. So as opposed to the visible sun, which sort of looks boring, when you're looking at, uh, please don't look at the sun invisible directly. Uh, at the radio waves at low radio frequencies, it's extremely dynamic. There's a lot which is happening all the time, right? Uh, there are many different kinds of emissions which have, uh, which have very different structures in the frequency and time plane, which is what I'm trying to show here. There are also span very large ranges in the parameter space. So this, these red boxes are brightness temperatures how hot would this body be if it is radiating like a black body? And these blue boxes are fractional circular polarizations, right? So it goes from something like 10 to the power 15 to around 10 to the power four in terms of brightness temperatures, 11 orders of magnitude and some two orders of magnitude in circular polarization. So what I want you to remember is that this emission is structured over very small or over a large range of temporal and spectral scales. It shows rap rapid changes in morphology nine orders of magnitude in intensity and two orders of magnitude in degree of fractional polarization, right? So very uh, variable. Just one slight primer about interferometry. It's a Fourier imaging technique. Think of a large number of telescopes as uh, organized pairwise. Each pair we call a baseline. Each baseline measures one Fourier component of the field of view the telescope is looking at. The larger is the number of Fourier components you can gather, the better your image reconstruction is going to be. And I hope I've just convinced you that the emission we are trying to reconstruct is very variable in both time and frequency. So you need to gather your data very quickly in time and over very small spectral spans, right? And that is what we refer to as, and also of course light is polarized. So you want, if you want full information out of what you're gathering, then you better do a full uh, polar imaging of the sky. So we need what we call now full polar snapshot spectroscopic imaging, right? And that has become possible only comparatively recently. These figures show you the locations in the Fourier plane where this particular telescope is gathering data. And you can see that it's practically quite full and it allows you a very good reconstruction as opposed to the instruments which have gone before, okay? These telescopes uh, produce humongous amounts of data. So it's already a challenge to make good images out of these. That's something we've been working on for a while now. Here are a couple of examples from the work by my group. Uh, this particular image is the highest dynamic range. By dynamic range, I mean the ratio of the brightest to the faintest believable feature in the image is about 10 to the power five, best which has ever been achieved. Uh, this is about 10 to the power three. This is when the sun is a sort of amorphous large blob, which is when it is hardest to image, okay? This particular image is a bit like seeing stars during daytime. This red spot is where the sun was supposed to be and it has been subtracted out. And there are some 80 other background sources which you can see here. So we are getting to a place where we can really image the sun very well, okay? Uh, I talked about polar polarization. Here are three different kinds of active solar emissions which vastly, with vastly, or at least substantially different degrees of fractional polarization. So what I want you to remember here is that we can now make images which with the dynamic range of which exceeds that of the earlier state of the art by at least two orders of magnitude, right? And this is naturally enabling extra uh, explorations of phase space which had never been accessible to us. 
And whenever you take such a large leap in what you're doing, you're bound to find new things, right? They, it has never happened in the sun. The sun has never failed to surprise us with um, a large number of new things which we had not anticipated whenever we have taken such a large leap in our ability to image the sun. So the same has held true for us. I don't want to go through this in any detail, but there's a bunch of new discoveries which our work has enabled. Uh, one which I find particularly interesting is what I refer to as WINCs. These are weak, impulsive, narrowband Poisson emissions. These, uh, more work needs to be done, but if things go the way they seem to be going right now, they will have a big implication on uh, explaining what is known as the coronal heating problem. How come there is a 2 million Kelvin corona sitting on top of a 5,800 Kelvin photosphere? We find pulsations of time scales from three to 30 seconds, practically everywhere we look. For the first time, we have detected linearly polarized emission from active solar emissions, which sort of goes against the conventional wisdom. So it's very interesting to figure out why that is happening. We have detected circularly polarized emission from the quiet sun, which was predicted in 1950s, but nobody ever had the capability to do it because our imaging was not good enough. And that is what we have achieved. And here's uh, an example of that linearly polarized emission. Uh, okay, so where do the challenges lie for us? The challenge one is to go from the raw data which your telescope gathers to build the image. That is what we have been working on. And that uh, there are sort of two aspects to that. There is the algorithmic complexity which is involved. That uh, there is more work to be done, but I think we have reached a very good place. We are uh, the state of the art at the moment. There's of course also the computational capacity. It's uh, computationally very intensive to make these radio images. But right now it is not our lack of computational capacity which is limiting us. What is limiting us really is our ability to extract the information from these images. Even with our existing telescope, we can make 11 million images an hour. Okay? And I have three petabytes of data in the archive. I've looked at less than 3% of that data because even with that, I'm already struggling with my group of students to figure out what these tell us. What is the structure of our data like? Let's say this is the sun. This is say one pixel on the sun or one resolution element. For each of these resolution elements, I have information about the four Stokes parameters, which tell you about the polarization of the emission from the sun. And for each of those parameters, things vary as a function of time and frequency. So right, this is my five dimensions in which I have to play two dimensions on the sun, time, frequency, and the four Stokes parameters. It, this is just another visualization, which is just a stack of images. The vertical axis is the frequency of how things change as a function of frequency. These oscillations you see, they are real. These are really high quality, high signal to noise data. You, these structures which you see, this is actually a loop, a magnetic loop on the sun. Okay, so there's a lot of interesting information which is buried inside these images. So the challenge which we are struggling with in our group is going from images to science. How do you extract information from these image hypercubes, right? the five dimensions I just mentioned? And like I tried to say, all sorts of features live in this zoo. Right? We have a wide variety of time and frequency structures, large spans in intrinsic brightness and polarization properties. Things move on the image plane, they come and go. There are all sorts of variations. There are physical reasons why some things would go linearly, while others would have quasi-periodicities. Different aspects have various relationships between them. So there are anti-correlations, for example, in some cases between the area of a source and its intensity. Uh, something which Shravan started or mentioned in his uh, talk, there are of course relationships with observations at other wave bands, right? The sun is one large connected system. We are looking at say heights of about 1.4 solar radii above the sun. Most of the information which we gather from other sources is much lower down in the solar uh, atmosphere, photosphere, chromosphere. They're all related, right? Things are flowing from down up and sometimes from above below as well. So we also need to look for relationships with what is happening in other observations. And of course, as we go looking for things, you will only find some fraction of what you look for. And you'll of course only choose to look for, look for either what you expect or you can imagine, right? So there's always this possibility of 
missing discoveries just because we didn't think of them, especially when you have taken such a big leap in what you're able to do now. And something like this, a problem like this is, I, I believe at least for my brain, it's sort of ill-suited. And also we, will, we have more capable telescopes on the way, which will give us even more data, right? So more to drown in. On the other hand, I think it's something which is extremely well-suited for AI ML sort of applications. It's about looking for structures or patterns or relationships in a large multidimensional data set. Uh, there are aspects of which which can be posed as a classification problem. There are other aspects which should be sort of unguided discovery. I mean, I don't know what is the formal phrase for that. Uh, we've been taking some baby steps ourselves, uh, though we've been sort of limiting ourselves only to three dimensions in whatever we have done so far. Part of this work has been done in collaboration with E4R, the Engineering for Research Group at Fort Worth Pune. Uh, so that's what I wanted to say about my sort of work. I also wanted to put in one slide for something which uh, a colleague at NCRA works on. This is Tirthankar Roy Chaudhary, who's also a cosmologist, and thank to the earlier speaker who set up the stage for uh, cosmology. So Tirth's interest is, lies in studies of what is called the epoch of reionization, the cosmic phase when the hydrogen was first, was ionized by the first stars which came about. And he works uh, in a sort of semi-analytical framework as opposed to a purely numerical framework which uh, Girish was earlier talking about. And he uses observations from different wave bands from 21 centimeters uh, in the radio to cosmic microwave background in the microwave part of the spectrum and also near UV and uh, near IR optical and UV to gather the data. The interpretation naturally requires a modeling, modeling requires simulations. The typical simulation run would take days actually, but because of the uncertainties in the physics, you, there are many parameters in your models which you need to adjust to various values and that creates a rather large parameter space to explore requiring you to do thousands or tens of thousands of these simulations. And that is where he thinks that the, the role of artificial intelligence might be useful by trying to have some AI-based emulators to train and predict. And the sorts of techniques he's thinking about are, are listed here. And what he has just started to work on is on optimizing these algorithms to a particular simulation technique. Okay? And I would uh, encourage you to get in touch with him if you're looking for more information on that. And with that, I'll stop. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah.